Okay, um, folks can see my screen? Yes, yes. Good, thank you. Okay, um, getting more comfortable with this technology, but uh, always apologies in advance if not. So um, let me first do a little preview of uh, what the, the focus for today will be. Um, as I did last week, I'll just, especially for people who maybe missed a session or whatever, I'll do a very quick little reminder of where we left off last time. And then again, as a reminder, still primarily focusing, although there are always overlaps on uh, children before about the age of five, we're gonna make a bit of a shift, although you can't really neatly separate all of this from more of a focus on children's emotional well-being, social competence, and so on, to cognitive development and <coughs> learning, typical development, COVID-related challenges. And then, um, as before, uh, looking at and talking about some resources for families and those who work with families, um, looking at supporting children's learning at home with the uh, closure or partial closure of preschools and a lot of childcare programs. And then uh, looking at the development of young children with disabilities and some of, again, the challenges and the potential supports for their well being during uh, this period. And um, some time for general discussion that maybe hasn't come up along the way, and then a bit of a preview of the next session. So, with that, quick reminder um, what we did was to begin with participant introductions, which was great. and kind of awe-inspiring about the, the depth and breadth of interests and experiences that people who are involved in this particular course. Well, yeah, I had a question uh, about a notice that came from the yes. Hartford, but I think it said it was through Berkshire Insurance uh, about a, a, a cancellation of the policy or uh, no payment received. And I'm pretty concerned about that because I said it would be finished on the, I, the 16th or something like that. I'm, and, uh, uh, Terry Lou, let me oh, go ahead and put Terry on mute and we can follow up later. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't think that, okay. Yeah, that. Okay, Mary Lou, I muted everyone. So if someone wants to talk, they should unmute themselves. Okay. Mary Lou, unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, the, the message was kind of alarming. Okay, yeah. so um, so we, we did some introductions. Um, we um, kind of reminded ourselves of what goals are for children's typical social and emotional development in that period. And then we looked at some examples of supportive resources, um, a lot of emphasis on what some factors are that protect children's healthy emotional development, especially under situations of stress. We talked some about the importance of grandparents and um, some digital ways and other ways that grandparents and others can remain connected with children. And then with Aaron's help, we learned some more about adaptations being made to home visiting programs, which have great proven effectiveness, but which are really challenged by how do you visit homes during a pandemic? So that brings us to this week's focus, which is, as I said, cognitive development and early learning for young children. Again, still with an emphasis on children under the age of five. So forgive me in advance, um, given that there's a mix of people who have a lot of background and expertise in this area and people who are curious, but 
um, do not have that sort of specialized background. Um, just a few examples of what is tremendous progress in the first five years of life. I'm just, just for the sake of conciseness, um, kind of zeroing in on three and four year olds. Um, progress in typical development that sometimes is labeled cognitive, thinking and reasoning, early learning, that whole area. And these from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Healthy Families and others, um, just some examples of what are considered typical milestones over these years. And you can see just um, skimming down, naming colors, understanding the concept of counting, sense of time, directions, remembering things like parts of a story, concepts like what's the same, what's different, pretend play, uh, make-believe, um, all sorts of like, comparisons, organizing, beginning concepts of cause and effect, um, attention span development, and so on. Um, the, um, the thing to remember about development, I think in, in any area, but focusing on this area of development is distinguishing between what develops, which these kinds of skills and competencies and how those skills develop. And one of the frequent misconceptions, um, understandably, is that it is necessary in order to acquire all of these competencies for children to have formal direct teaching of each of these. Now, granted, there are things like children um, don't learn to, well, nobody ties their shoes anymore, but you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> children don't learn to tie their shoes just sort of off the top of their head. There are things where uh, focused adult guidance and instruction is, is really important. But um, also sometimes people sort of stereotype the, the question about development as well. What is it? Is it nature or is it nurture? Are children just born with or automatically develop certain kinds of understanding and ability or is it that they are taught to understand those things, to have certain skills and so on. And um, I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, reading something by a, a noted old developmental psychologist, Anna Anastasi. And she said, the, the question is not, is it hereditary, is it heredity or environment, or is it nature or nurture? The question is how, how those aspects combine and interact with each other to produce development. The other thing that since we're shifting supposedly from one aspect to another, the other thing that always is emphasized as we developmental psychologists and others think about children's development is that every area or every domain of development is connected with every other area. So for example, Last week, we were focusing on children's emotional competence, their social development, and so on. And it is clear, if you even just think about these few examples, that children's, um, as we actually talked about last week, that children's, for example, emotional security or the children's ability to rely on a caring adult makes it easier for them to develop certain kinds of understanding, uh, to have the motivation, the, the social connections, the interest, the ability to share uh, experiences. Recalling the parts of the story requires somebody to tell a story and to have that child on their lap and so on. So every aspect of development influences and is 
influenced by every other aspect. That is um, <laughs> a, a very shorthand version of some of the, the essential concept of what this notion of early childhood development is all about, that it doesn't, things don't just develop on their own, they develop within the context of relationships, that every area of the development is influenced by and influences every other area. Taking that now to COVID-19, we want to think about with respect to here, children's cognitive development and learning, what it is that this pandemic may challenge or put at risk. And I'm just gonna take us off that for now and ask you to think a bit from your experience, uh, from what, what you know about young children's development and the kinds of skills that um, we hope that they will gain during these years. What are some of the ways that this pandemic is affecting or may affect either for all children or for some children, their ability to acquire these competencies? Either put your hand up and wave or do a little hand raise and uh, let's see what your thoughts are. Okay, I'll go. Great, thank you, Karen. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, one of the most difficult aspects is children learn so much from hands-on activities and playing with toys and manipulating and working through their environment. And sitting in front of a computer, trying to learn and interact is just counter intuitive for every way that really young, young children learn. So that is one mm -hmm. of the factors. That's, um, I'm really glad that you raised that and that's going to kind of um, preview some of the things that, that I want to focus on later on. Uh, it certainly puts that at risk. And I guess I would make a re related comment which is going back to how do children develop skills, trying to uh, help families and others see that it does not require sitting in front of a computer, as you said, Karen, in order for children, for example, to learn to count, right? Um, there are other ways to uh, fall in love with numbers and, and to use, um, concepts of quantity and, and so on in, in engaging ways. So anyway, thank you for sharing that. What are, what are some other things that might, yes, yeah, thank you, Claudia. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Thank you. Sure, I'm on a phone, so <laughs> barely see the words. Um, children learn, so many children learn in the context of playing with other children. And if they're isolated at home and their parents are working on their own computers, the child is an isolate, and that can be a huge limitation on their active learning. One of, one of the reasons, certainly, that many parents want their children eat, to attend early childhood programs is so that their children can have the benefit of those re social relationships, as, as you know, not both for uh, the, the sharing and learning to negotiate and all of those kinds of things that um, we were talking more about last week, but also for uh, Trying out, there, there was in the list, there's, there's a, a mention of pretend play. And certainly we've all seen children have very, very rich pretend play on their own, right? But 
thinking back to my children, especially our younger son when he was young, what a pretender, but what he, what he needed, what he thrived on was making up these elaborate pretend scenarios with other children. And that was his rationale for going to preschool and being with other children. Then of course, there's the not being out with other children at all, which is, has been the case for, for many, many children. The, um, and I guess, you know, I, I also kind of raised the question, um, are there challenges for some children more than others? We know what the benefits are of high quality early childhood programs, out of home, preschool, kindergarten, childcare, Head Start, you know, you could go on and on. Uh, those kinds of high quality programs, as many of you know from your own professional experience, are really shown to be extremely valuable for all aspects of children's development and learning. And to create competencies, cognitive early learning competencies that then predict greater success in later years in acquiring more advanced academic skills. So there's a real risk of losing, it's not a, a race, but there's a real risk in losing um, the, the potential gains in cognitive competence and essential early learning skills. Other thoughts? Carlotta, um, can you unmute yourself? Thank I you. I sure can. I'm particularly concerned about children who don't speak English as their first language and English isn't spoken in the home. And those children have very little opportunity during this period to hear English and be prepared for school. Yeah. Have, do you have some experience yourself with that in, in your work, Carlotta? I have. I have had experience with, um, when I retired, I actually volunteered in a program for the children of immigrant families where they were not speaking English at home. It was actually a dual generation program for both the okay. parents and the children. Hmm. And I just think those, those kinds of experiences where the children are in a setting where they're hearing a lot of English, it's such an important preparation for kindergarten. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, in fact, when I was thinking about um, preparing this OLLI class, I, was very much thinking that that is a group of children and families that we should really focus on. And I think, you know, as I was thinking about, okay, where, okay, where can I put that in? Uh, I think in a week or two weeks, I want to, and I, I may connect with you, Carlotta, but I, I want to set aside um, some time to talk about and think about English language learners, both um, in the preschool period, but also in the early and middle grades of school. And um, I, I have a couple of colleagues who really know a lot about and are very concerned about those kinds of issues. And um, it's a lot easier to pull people in via Zoom than other ways, but um, one in, in particular who used to be at Brown and now is, um, it, she's from Puerto Rico and she's back in Puerto Rico now. And if I could snag her or my colleague, Linda Espinosa, who I think some of you know, um, you know, Linda, um, she's, she's just, she's very, passionate um, about these issues. And um, anyway, I'm, um, she's retired in Colorado, uh, but I might be able to get her either in a little recording or otherwise. Um, it's, I, I care a lot about those issues, but it's not my area of expertise. So thank you, Carlotta, for bringing up those issues because I think it's, um, 
it's an area where we, we really, this is an example of one of the groups of children and families who have been differentially impacted um, in, in a lot of ways, but in particular in uh, potentially in academic um, outcomes. And uh, there is, it, it kind of reminds me of something that I was just gonna share a little bit uh, with you about, let me um, just go back and share my screen here again. There we go. Um, oh. There we go. So I came across uh, something that was just published a couple of weeks ago um, that really gave me uh, a lot of food for thought. And it had to do with declines in families' enrollment of children in public kindergarten, even in places where they could you know, I see a couple of people nodding here where they could enroll their children. Um, it used to be that some of you may have heard the phrase academic redshirting. There are well-to-do parents who many of whom have often thought they would like to give their children the gift of time. You can sort of see my, by my voice, I'm not a fan. Uh, you know, by just holding them back from school for a year so they could, you know, just sort of develop and grow and so on. I mean, if I can sort of see maybe if it's like a really terrible kindergarten program, the, the idea does not have research behind it, but that's sort of the old idea that a lot of the children who were not enrolled in kindergarten were children who were from well-to-do families and the families had other options and they were just doing wonderful things with their kids. But the delay in re enrollment now is very unique to the pandemic. Um, and I think I gave you in the resources a uh, link to this piece. I'm quite sure that I did. Um, no, a lot of parents, as I think Karen made reference to, really are just leery about online learning. They're not seeing good examples of it. Um, they have read about, with good reason, the potentially harmful effects of overuse of screen time. Um, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics used to be sort of dead and pre-pandemic, you know, limit the amount of radically limit the screen time for children and um, the lack of, if, if learning is all virtual, digital, the lack of interaction with toys and games and children and, and so on. And just the, the stress of whether it is in-person kindergarten or a virtual kindergarten, right? there are parents who have been saying, you know, it looks like kindergarten is just going to be my kid sitting in front of a screen and I have to work from home or I have to organize, you know, childcare and I can't, I can't deal with it. But the equity issues that are coming up are really huge um, because many children are not engaged in worthwhile learning, not through any fault of parents, but the opportunities to learn are really limited. And as um, this piece in the conversation says, these inequities exacerbate the already wide racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic achievement gaps. Um, they know evidence, some of you may have read this, that um, this is not preschool, but older, but it's predicted. Children's progress in math has been down, literacy less so, but you know, associated with the pandemic. And in particular, of course, from for children who are living in low income communities. And uh, this is putting children at risk for later academic problems. So we will talk more in a couple of weeks about this concept of learning loss and the challenges as schools reopen, the likelihood that the um, 
the range of knowledge and skills that children may have as they return, let's say, to elementary school is likely to be significantly greater. And then for teachers, the question arises, how does one deal with that in ways that are developmentally supportive and um, helpful and narrow rather than exacerbating those kinds of gaps. So um, those are challenges. What I want to do in a more positive note is to look a bit more closely at the benefit, and this is why I said, Karen, you were kind of previewing this, uh, making a case for what has been called often recently playful learning and for the potential for children to learn this way, both at school and also at home. And I hope that I can show you a little video um, that for, especially for those of you who may not be convinced about the benefits of play for early learning, uh, just a few short examples of the way that this works. I should say, because I think Claudia, you might know uh, this fellow who's kind of a, another work friend of mine. Do you know Jeffrey Trawick Smith? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, he, and he, he did a great. Yeah. He, 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 he wasn't at your university, was he? I'm sorry, what? He wasn't at your university? No, he wasn't. Eastern Connecticut, I think he's at. Yeah, that's right. right. That, yeah, yeah, I was Carlotta, saying, you know that as well. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, he, he's written some really terrific things about play and he's got a nice little video, which I hadn't seen before, but I right. came across it. And uh, fingers crossed that I can make this work. Let us see. Um, oh, wait a minute, share screen. Oh, now I'm gonna do share sound. Um, hmm. I wonder if I can just do it from here. I had this open. Hmm. Um, how could I pull this down? Can you click on the link? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's up above this one. Huh. Oh, is there a way to scroll? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm I'm looking for. Whether here I can maybe if I move this. On uh, way on the side right, it looks up. like maybe. Yeah. Far side scroll bar to the right of the photos. Of oh side. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up this way. Um, something's going around in circles. Maybe. Oh, the suspense. <laughs> Maybe loading. <laughs> Do you see my screen? I can see the screen yes. right where the blue circle is on the link. Yep. You don't, you don't see the video? Are you seeing the video? No? Play is an activity that young people do every day. And we all know that it's important. Mary Lou, can you minimize the over screen so we... The, the, the white screen with um, 
with a link on it. Can you minimize that somewhere upper right on there? Is there a blue bar on top and a little minus sign? Oh upper, that's what I'm seeing. Hmm. A blue bar. Do you have a blue bar on the top of your screen? A dark blue I bar? do not. Okay. Put your mouse. Okay. Try hovering your mouse over the top of your screen and see if that blue bar comes down. Oh, wait a minute. I see. I I see. I see. Okay. Um. Okay. Then on, on the far right, there's an X. There's a. a Two, two papers and a minima. Nope. Wait a minute. Um, Mary Lou, it looks like we lost your screen share, but if you want to go ahead and restart the screen share from the YouTube, that should take us there. Yeah, now now it seems like it's it's there. Let me try one more time, okay? Yeah, it seems to have appeared. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. Okay. Wait, let me, see. let me, see. yeah, but let me, I'm not sure we have the video, the audio. Let's see if we do. But did you know that research shows yes. that play is actually yes. central yes. to young children's learning? What can you do to help children get the most learning from their play? When you look at play, when you watch children play, um, it's pretty obvious that it's a really enjoyable, fun activity for children. Probably is what makes childhood so enjoyable. What is not as obvious maybe is how important play is for children's development. Research has found that play helps children uh, to think creatively. Uh, they uh, learn all kinds of different problem-solving strategies when they play. Play has been linked to language development, uh, and certainly it leads to uh, positive social skills. Uh, one of the more important things that uh, research shows is that play is related to reading and, and learning to write. One way that play helps children in uh, literacy areas is that it's very symbolic. For example, when they're using a toy telephone to represent a real phone, they're using a symbol. Uh, that's not unlike looking at a word and uh, seeing that it represents something that's not present or something in real life. One element of play that I think is important to observe in children is pretend or make believe. One thing you want to watch for as you're watching children play is, do they engage in make-believe? Do they take on the roles of pretend characters or other people in their lives? Uh, do they use objects in make-believe ways? Uh, do they invent imaginative play situations to play out with their peers? There are um, a variety of ways that uh, adults can kind of enhance this kind of pretend. Uh, one really enjoyable way to do this is simply to play along with children, to actually take a make-believe role, play parallel or with uh, children, to make uh, play suggestions, to ask questions, to kind of encourage this kind of role play. You know how much it's going to cost to get my car fixed, Jane. A second element that I think is important for adults to uh, look at when they're observing children's play is social interaction and related to that you know verbalization you know using language as you're interacting with your peers I need another long one there is no more long one yeah. you want to see a lot of language uh, in, in this kind of play no, setting maybe we can do this no no this is a long one take a role, try to facilitate more language by asking questions, uh, trying to facilitate some peer interaction. A third element of play that I think is important for adults to uh, look for is uh, what's sometimes been called play complexity. As children get a little bit older into the preschool years, what you like to see is uh, a greater variety of enactments as they're carrying out a role. If children aren't playing that kind of complex play, if they're still quite simple and repetitive,
than in uh, make-believe or in uh, other kinds of play that they engage in, it might be time for an adult to move in and facilitate. It sounds like you're playing house. <laughs> Are you playing house? Uh, again, from question asking, maybe suggestion, suggesting some new enactments to perform will help the play to become more complex. What's this baby's One thing I'd like to be sure to caution about is that playing with children is great fun, and so all of these strategies to facilitate play will be very enjoyable for, for the adult as well as the child. The thing we have to be careful about, though, is not to stay too long, to overstay our welcome, but to be sure that after a period of enriching children's play, we get out of the play center to allow them to play on their own. We need to be very respectful of children's play activities. When you enhance uh, children's play in these ways, when you facilitate uh, their uh, pretend play, uh, the complexity of their play, social interaction, not only are you enhancing their play, uh, but this leads to directly to overall advancement in children's development. Um, it's a, play is a wonderful tool for parents and teachers. It's a wonderful vehicle for promoting uh, larger areas of development. Okay. Um, 52. 52? What do you need to Obviously that uh, obviously that video uh, focuses on preschools and in some ways it gives us a, uh, a sense of regret that so many schools are closed and those social opportunities are, are really closed to lots of children. But it also reminds us of all of the things that children gain by playing, whether by themselves, with adults, with other children. And uh, I, uh, one of the things that a lot of people are trying to do, I think of Kathy hirsch Pasek's work and Rob Roberta Golenkopf's work, is to encourage families during the pandemic, not just to think about online, uh, instruction as, as a way to build children's cognitive skills, their knowledge of fun, fundamental uh, school res readiness skills, but to think more about things like building literacy skills through just back and forth conversations with children. And you know, whether uh, this is something that you are doing on your own or you're encouraging families to do, looking for opportunities to ask questions that spark conversations about what children are seeing, what they're hearing, what they're observing, asking questions that aren't just yes or no answers. Where do you think milk comes from? Or uh, you're unpacking groceries at home. Uh, you know, which let's let's make the, the put the green vegetables together and the red vegetables together or walking around the neighborhood thinking about what do you think they're having for dinner in their house, that kind of thing. Prompting children to notice patterns. This is the foundations of mathematics, sorting objects, whether the objects are socks or uh, sorting clothes by color. Uh, walking around outside and noticing what is different today than yesterday. Is it the weather? Is it uh, the shadows at different times of the day? Thinking about, this is something that um, in a, um, again, these are all in your resources, um, in a, a little Brookings Institution brief, there's an emphasis on informally helping children think about spatial relationships, not just the vocabulary, but what's under, what's above, what's next to, on the right. There's a lot of research now that those basic STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, mathematics are really founded on, among other things, an understanding of and enjoyment of thinking spatially. So again, none of this is talking about formal lessons and sitting children down and having them uh, be drilled 
in the, the definitions of special, spatial concepts or that kind of thing, but instead building into everyday interactions and everyday experiences, the kind of thinking, reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, exploration, curiosity, that are really the foundations of current and later cognitive development. So all of those are part of what has been called playful learning, thoughtful, well, uh, well thought through, well implemented playful learning, but in ways that are realistic for uh, for families, especially for families that have busy lives that are often stressed, uh, little everyday ways to strengthen children's knowledge, curiosity, reasoning, problem solving skills. And fortunately, there are lots of resources that um, can be drawn on, on to um, to further that, uh, I'm going to challenge myself again, I think. Um, so what I want to try to do, and again, fingers crossed with um, some of the technological challenges that I'm faced with, but we're overcoming them. I want to I try to show you one or two uh, online resources that families can use directly, and you may have others that, that you can share as well, not to sit children in front of for hours, but that can give them sources of ideas for everyday engaging things that children can do and that they can do with children or for children in order to stimulate their development. What I'm going to try to do again is, this is not a video, so I don't have to worry about sharing the sound. It's just so strange that this didn't come up. Let me share this. Okay, what I want to try to show you is PBS has some called PBS Parents. Some of you may have seen it or be familiar with it. And I think that I have, um, now, can you see, wave at me if you see what's on my screen. It says age five. We're seeing the sheet again that has one, two, three, four, five. Ah. Okay, so what I need to do is, let me see if this helps. Nope. I'm going to try again. Okay, now I think I have it. It's sort of like it, it waits. Do you see it now? Not yet. <laughs> Okay, got it. You do? Valentine's Day yeah. activities, it's up, age five. Yes, okay, great. Um, okay, I just wanna show this to you by way of demonstration. I would like to get rid of myself. Okay, what when you go to this, and this is, there, there are links in the resources, but for example, Let's say that you have a five-year-old. You, you see up here, there's five age, two, three, four, five. You see that? Seven, eight, okay? You can click at different ages. You can look at milestones by topic. Can you see, you kind of see that? So emotions, social skills, literacy. Then 
there's literacy. And you can, it's a wonderful search function, okay? This is something, again, either, you know, most of you directly are not looking for your three-year-old child. Great to suggest to people who have young children or, or working with parents who are looking for online resources. Let's say, let's say we click on age four, okay? There's a little introductory information here. If you want to learn more about reading aloud, let's, I'm, I'm just making this up, or um, all right, you could sign up for a newsletter. Uh, let's see, you can see what's on today. I'm going to go back. Games, recipes, see all literacy activities if you really want to see everything. You can look for activities to do at home. Uh, you can filter them, uh, go on a safari at home. So in some ways it's a bit overwhelming, but it's also for People who are just, I can't think what to do that would be worthwhile. It's a heck of a lot better than Google because it's really filtered through um, resources that have connections with PBS. Read-alongs are, I have to show you this. Okay, I didn't know, it, is it gonna load the, yes, okay. Would you like Michelle Obama to read a book? <laughs> <laughs> to your grandchild, for example, okay? <laughs> um, you know, they're in Spanish, English, um, English and German, that's total. That's completely crazy, I think that means. Anyway, multicultural. Multicultural, multi-ethnic. Um, a lot of follow-up activities and so on. So you get the general idea here. This is well worth having some fun with and exploring and the link is in the resources. There, I wanted to share with you that, I, I know I've told you that I do some work with UNICEF and um, one of the things that I've been doing recently is through a colleague who's the head of early childhood in the region that is the Europe um, Central Asia region for UNICEF, they are developing for low-income families, which is UNICEF's mission, that are impacted by the pandemic in the region. They're trying to develop very accessible, simple ideas for at-home enrichment, stimulation activities that parents can do with kids. It's another example of this kind of thing. It's still in process. I love the idea. They're calling it the, a learning passport for parents. And parents can go in to this site. They can do it on their phone. I mean, they're user-friendly. Um, every, hardly a parent in the region, no matter what their in, income, does not have a phone with access to the kind, this kind of thing. They can put in the age, they can put in the kind of activities that they want, and there they are. Let me see if I can find you. The, the UNICEF um, site, the Learning Passport site is still really in progress, but they're borrowing a lot from in Australia. Um, something that, so I've, I've been doing a lot of the editing of these activities and um, Australia had some, has something that they call Parent Buddy. And, and Raising Children. This is what I wanna try to open for us, just so you can see what that's like. Now, are you still seeing 
something that we don't want. Yep. Still sitting on the white page. Right. Okay. We don't want that. I'm going to stop it and try again. <laughs> it's got to be a bit better way, right? Now, do you see it? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. But wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it's this is magical thinking. I have no idea why this slightly convoluted process is working, but it seems to be. So I just think this is cool. Australia, those of you in early childhood probably know, they are way ahead, and New Zealand as well of a lot of, at least nationally, small country, but what nationally we are doing in this country for young children and families. One of the things that they have done is to develop a free national parenting website where families can access, and you see across the top how you know, compared to the PBS site, which is a little, like I'm getting a headache, there's so much stuff, that pregnancy, newborns, babies, toddlers, preschoolers, I mean, I think a lot of states um, could do something like this. Preteens, teens, grown-ups, grown autism. So you can, let's say we go to preschoolers. Is it going to do this for me? Yes, it's waiting. Hmm. Now, I don't know where, why it went there, but um, well, there we go. I think it's just slow. Yes, okay, here we go, three to five years. And then what they have done Again, I think this stimulates ideas for other kinds of resources. Simple icons, connecting and communicate. So different, in a way, domains of development or learning. There are also videos about preschool development or activities for preschoolers. Um, we've had to be, for the UNICEF, some of what's on the site, just as a comment, um, still is for more advantaged families. Like, I don't know how many activities there are that have to have Legos. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, a lot of the families that UNICEF is working with in Central Asia and Europe, um, they would never in a million years have Legos at home. Um, and this just sort of takes it for granted. They also, however, are becoming very good about thinking about indigenous families in Australia. Although I would say there's still, you know, a little bit of more of a white family bias, but um, let's see, connecting and communicating. I'm just playing around with this for you. Okay. Um, oh, I remember this. So preschoolers communicating. Okay, you see what you get to here? Tips for communicating with babies and children. Um, talking and play. Read play, I, there's a lot on playful learning. So here you could read play ideas to help preschoolers with talking and language. You see like cute little blonde girl, but anyway. So there's usually a typical Here's, here's what's happening at this age. Here are some play ideas, what to expect, play ideas to encourage preschoolers to talk. Then there are just little, little tips, read aloud, of course, sing songs together, um, limiting screen time, tell us what you think. So the the organization of the UNICEF materials isn't going to be identical to this, but as I say, because that's still in process, just wanted to 
show you this as an example of ideas to use. I'm curious about grownups. Let me just go to that before we get off this. Grandparents, looking after yourself, balancing work and childcare, videos. They have some articles that have been translated into other languages that are relatively common in Australia. Um, of course, COVID-19 specific resources and so on. So, that's that. Um, let's, let's see, looking at our time here. I was going to talk a little more specifically about digital learning, but I think because that also comes up next week and the week after, I think I'm gonna hold off on that and there we go. So I've go back to that and now shift to thinking about young children with disabilities, okay? Uh, I think that my guess is without a show of hands that if you just look at the incidence of disabilities um, in early childhood and beyond, that there probably is hardly anyone in this group who does not have a family member or the child of a close friend who has some kind of disability or other special learning or developmental need. And uh, some of you teach or I know Laura or have taught about early intervention and early childhood special education. If you have, then you know, but not everybody does, that we do have in this country and have had beginning in the 1970s, um, systems of su services and supports and legal protections for children who have a range of special needs. And I say this because it is not the case in a number of countries that I've worked with in my work with the World Bank and Save the Children and UNICEF, where in many countries, children are basically kept home if they're born with a disability and it's considered a shame to the family. In other countries, they're way beyond what we're doing. But um, children who in our country who are identified as having special needs um, have, as again, many of you, but not all of you know, have developed with families, IEPs, individual edu education plans, or for children under three, individual family service plans, IFSPs. And what these do is set goals for children and create services to help children make progress toward those goals. The special challenge with COVID-19 is that many, many of the services that are have been in place for young children and older children with disabilities have been discontinued, either discontinued or are not available in the form that they were available previously. And again, this creates big challenges for this kind of situation creates challenges for all children, but for children who have disabilities and whose progress and those of us in this field believe course, that all children can make progress. The progress may look different. The progress may occur at a different pace, but all children can make progress with the services and supports for them and for their families to which they're entitled. And however, big challenges, as I said, are uh, now 
occurring big whoops because of the pandemic. Uh, that's what I meant to click. Laura has um, experience. I'm trying to see where you are here, Laura. Uh, hi, Laura. Um, if you could unmute yourself, Laura and I had an email brief conversation and Laura um, is someone who is in the early childhood special education field and is continuing to work with students, right? St teacher candidates at Elms College in Chicopee, correct? That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it would be great if you would share some of what, what the context is that, that your students are working in and what some of the challenges are that, that they're encountering and <laughs> what what you may be helping them uh, deal with. So anything at all, thank you in advance. Sure, well, I'll just, and I'll just mention a few. And um, again, some other people, other participants may, you have may, may have some of your own experiences too. Um, again, I, when we think about children with disabilities, it's a, a broad group of children. I would say that for students who are, uh, sometimes we call it more of like a hidden disability. Maybe they have a slight processing concern or an attention concern. Um, when we do anything, just like we were seeing online, they may have difficulty just even finding what it is that they're supposed to be watching online, or they might get distracted. Um, and so anything that's going to be given to them uh, really needs to maybe have a few more uh, structures put in place. When we think about it, and I'm thinking about students now learning remotely at home. There are some schools that I know that are, you know, uh, in class. Um, but the parents that I've talked to are just that, you know, their child is told to go on the computer and, you know, they, and, it, and it's difficult for all children. And then we just need to remember that a student with, you know, processing difficulty or an attention difficulty is even going to have more difficulty finding that. Now, there are some, some of my, um, students you know are working what they're working to get their licensure so they may be an assistant in a classroom and there are some uh as you know uh there are some schools that the students with disabilities have come back to the school uh yeah. because they were thought to need that level of support and some of the challenges of course that are facing those students and um are that they may not they may have sensory difficulties and not want to wear a mask or whatever, they really need to be very near the teacher. So social distancing is very, mm. difficult. all of those, they, they just need that very close contact from the teacher um, or who's ever instructing them. And so that is just making it difficult for their um, education. Um, we always say with um, students with disabilities is that they need explicit teaching. So even, Right now, we've been talking about which is that how play is difficult for all children, and it was COVID. And when we have children with disabilities who we want to have play with, sometimes they don't quite always like read the signals from their peers. They actually need to have modeling, you know, of how you take a turn with someone, how you share this, what words you say to the other child. Uh, so that you can build those relationships with your peers. So it takes a lot of explicit teaching and that may not be able to occur when we're all facing uh, COVID. Um, just two other areas I thought I would mention is that yeah. and many students with disabilities have what we call a related service or speech and language therapy, which I believe Mary, uh, Mary Lou you were talking about last week. Um, now I, I have heard that some of this has happened through telehealth um, and that some parents were actually taught, you know, the strategies to use through telehealth so that they could do it with their child at home. But again, it's just another piece to think about that um, the, children, the child may not only be receiving educational services, but also a related service such as speech, speech and language therapy and how then they would get that and how we deliver that the information to parents so that they can then do those strategies with their child. Um, and the last one is just um, assessment, because again, when you're working with children with disabilities, there's a lot of assessment usually happening. You know, how are they performing on 
vocabulary, how are they performing on quantitative skills, uh, turn-taking skills? And um, generally, when we think about that, a child is working with an adult across the table. They're, they're, they're given some materials to work with, see how that they interact with that. And again, when we're thinking about all of that now with masks and social distancing, it may have to happen on the computer. I have seen, for instance, there's the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is done with all, with many children. But again, it's looking to see, um, Carlotta, you had mentioned too, uh, our ELL learners, um, but it's you know done to see what type of vocabulary school, skills a child has. Now they've created the, the test to be done online. They've just done that. But these tests were created not for a COVID situation. So then it is, is the test reliable if we're using it in some other way? Um, so there's just, mm -hmm. I just mentioned a couple of the challenges that are happening. Yeah, that's just um, a, a couple of quick comments and then I, I'm hoping that some other people who have some experience in this area can, can also share. Uh, I think that question of assessment is really interesting and important. I'm thinking that I'm going to connect back with our younger son is, a, I may have mentioned this before, is a school psychologist out in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin. He actually is a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse and trains school psychologists in a master's program. He teaches assessment. And I'm. this is making me, Laura, very curious to know what he is teaching his school psych graduate students about doing assessment often in a completely remote, uh, you know, sort of sort of context. Anyway, um, let me pause and see if others, either Carlotta or somebody else, want to either ask Laura something or share some of your experiences with some of the realities of. Um, yes, thank thank you, Carlotta. So I was curious, Laura, if you have students who are in the field who are working with special education children who are in classrooms, as I hear about districts who are putting children back in classrooms, it seems to me that, at least from what I hear on the news, they're putting them in classrooms where they're not integrated with typically developing children. And so that, I find that a bit worrisome that we might Oh, yes. And let me, before you answer that, just for um, our other colleagues in, in this course who may not be in the field of education, um, the best practice now with a lot of research behind it across ages, but as we're focusing on younger children, is to um, have children with and without disabilities together in quote inclusive settings as much as possible because there are documented benefits to children with and without disabilities. However, it takes even under the best of circumstances a great deal of knowledge and sophistication on the part of teachers and classroom setups that uh, support that inclusive environment. Um, if we have time a little bit later, and if, if not, I'll uh, put it in at the beginning of next week. I have a video that I could show you part of about uh, an inclusive preschool that has shifted to remote learning. Anyway, Laura, um, in response to Carlotta's well, yes, and, and I would just say, I don't really, I don't want to speak for all school districts because as I understand it, each school district is kind of making its own, um, and as, as, as many of you, if you have grandchildren, I, every school district is making their own, um, you know, uh, changes. Some of them are coming back to school, but yes, the students I, were speak, I was speaking of were, uh, my students were working with children who were on the autism spectrum. And those students did come back to the school. I don't believe there are other children in the school, possibly some, but not the whole full body of students. But they came because, again, 
to have um, remote learning would have been very difficult for them. But I was, but still, even when they came to school, these are the challenges with masks and social distancing. But you're mm -hmm. quite right, Carlotta. This is what we have seen is that inclusion is really um, very important for all students. Uh, but right now, I think all of us are dealing with um, how to school all children. And so um, it's, it's impacting that inclusive schools movement. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm thinking that I might, if you want, be able to show you some of this discussion between um, a teaching team and a parent of a child with disability about the pandemic and inclusion. Let me see if I can get that, okay? Um, This is from DEC, the Division for Early Childhood of the Council for Exceptional Children. Story from head to toe. And what I really enjoyed about this one is that it was also incorporating the gross motor movements. So I asked the students to you've had a lot of fun Thank well today you, i'm going to read you a story that's also going to get our bodies let me go back to the beginning i'm anna cordis i'm a preschool intervention specialist at big Wana elementary and I'm Erin Nerjavik. I'm also a preschool intervention specialist at Big Walnut Elementary. Hi, my name is Lindsay and my son is in uh, Anna's class in preschool. We have our Monday through Thursday Inclusive Preschool and Erin is on one side of the trailer and I'm on the other and there is a connecting door. Erin and I each have a morning class and we each have an afternoon class. Eight kids who have special needs and then eight typically developing peers. We run the trailer like really one cohesive unit. When we plan for the week during the typical school year, we plan it together. So the kiddos have the same morning work, they have the same academic tasks they're doing, they have the same station rotations that we do. So when the pandemic hit, we kind of kept that up. We kept it simple and we split the work down the middle. So the kids still got to see both of our faces, which is nice because we have you know, relationships with kids that are in each other's classrooms. So that's what we pictured when we thought of how to present this remotely to parents. Knowing the kids that we're working with, knowing um, preschoolers in general, you know, they need to have a routine that they're going to follow, know what to expect. And that's what our schedule provided. You know, we use visual schedules anyway in the classroom. So we just thought they just mirror that and what we sent home to parents. And we got great feedback. Stepping into this teacher role with your child was a challenge. You know, my son is really used to looking at me as mom in our house is where he comes home after school and gets to, to play and kind of let loose. So having to kind of change it into an act environment and a routine schedule around schoolwork from the house uh, was definitely a learning opportunity for my son and myself. I will say though that I felt like Anna and Erin made it very easy. They had all sorts of lessons and links that we could go through. They would post it a week in advance so that if you wanted to work ahead on anything with your child or if you needed extra time, it was all there and laid out for you. We sent out this four-day PDF, which basically mirrors the schedule that the kids see at school, 
at home. So while they are at school, they already see this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it goes through our day and tells them what we're going to be doing, what to expect. So when we designed this remote learning curriculum, so to call it, we decided that we wanted to keep it the same as possible so that when the kids opened it up at home, they knew what to expect. We put it into a PDF so that all parents could open it. Each one of these icons is linked to an activity or a resource for them to use. So I think for parents, this really laid it all out there. If I'm going to be doing school today, I have seven activities. It was really all laid out for me. It was a balance, I would say, of like movement activities, craft activities, academics, And there was even like a choice board of ways they could help around the house, which I thought was really clever way to get kids involved with their families. The thing about all of this is when you put it all together, this is less than an hour of engagement for these kiddos, which especially at this age is really the maximum of where we would want them to be. We don't want them to be sitting and doing computer work for an hour. So we We do have some movement in there, some things to do around the house, but we wanted to keep it short and sweet. So not only could these kids be successful with it, but so could the families. We didn't want to ask too much of them. We wanted to make it flexible for parents. There were definitely parents who would take some of it and leave some of it. That was kind of our motto through it. Take what works, leave what doesn't. When in doubt, go outside and play. My son has some fine motor delays and he also receives like speech services. So I would kind of look through their lesson plans and know if I wasn't able to get through everything that they had listed, what are those particular things that I think my son would most benefit? I really focus in on what his opportunities were and his challenges and really try to focus on that from home. And if I would ever didn't have enough resources for that, between Anna and Aaron and his um, school therapy staff, they were very supportive of coming up with individualized ideas for him to work on. One of the days that we really enjoyed this week, especially was Thursday. So just like a parent would, we scroll through getting down to Thursday again, they would see that their first activity would be a read aloud. So if we open this up, it's going to link us to a YouTube page. And the reason why we used YouTube was because it was hard to link long videos. That was one of the things that we found through remote learning is that once a video got to a certain length, you couldn't send an email. It was hard to upload onto Schoology. And so we created unlisted posts onto YouTube and it made it really easy. It was private. So we weren't going to be putting it out there to everybody, but anybody with the link was able to view it. So this is an Eric Carle story from head to toe. And what I really enjoyed about this one is that it was also incorporating the gross motor movements. So I asked the students to move along with me in this story and move like an animal, which was really fun. Okay. I, um, are we back? Yes. I think, um, I think that whole video, which is about a half an hour or so, if you are interested in this kind of thing, is well worth in the resources linking to and having a look at. But the first part, I think, is is interesting and valuable because it illustrates the, ideally, the collaboration between general education and special education teachers and how they took that relationship into remote learning. I really liked at the end how they thought through, okay, if we're doing this remotely, we wanna make sure, for example, if we're reading, it's just not a passive, the kids are sitting at the screen, but they have something to do. And that activities aren't in a block of sitting passively for an hour, but are engaging families and using every, everyday activities and so on. It seems like without, without knowing anything about the individuals or the schools, it's, it seems like a really um, nice example of the potential of um, digital learning and the, the use of remote resources. And I guess the other thing, just as a comment that I really um, liked about their thinking 
was the way that they tried as much as possible to include elements that the children, both the children with disabilities and the typically developing children already were familiar with. So using that visual schedule that they use with all the children, but simplifying it more and having some of the elements of the schedule be things that would be realistic for families to you to use at home and so on. But that, you know, one of the kind of themes that I think we've seen so far in supporting children during the pandemic is the importance of sameness and routines and uh, keeping structures that, um, we know children thrive if they know what to expect. And this is, um, as I think um, Laura said, you know, it's certainly important for all children, but even more for many children who um, have disabilities, special needs, um, that, that predictability and, and, their, and that routine. And one of the things that's been difficult for all children is even just, you know, am I going to school today? It's Tuesday, it's Thursday. Um, you know, is school going to be open? Is it going to be closed? All of those disruptions are really challenging for all children. So uh, I, I think that's, that's just a, a really nice example. And I, example, and I have a feeling that we'll talk more about uh, children with disabilities, and I'll have some more examples to share with you in the coming weeks. Um, I think I'm, I'm looking at the time, probably if there are a couple of either comments or questions, um, either about the children with disabilities issues or other aspects of what we've talked about today, we certainly have time for that, or we can have a little preview of what's gonna happen next week. Raise your hand or speak if there's something else that you would like to add at this point. All right. Um, let me just go back then to Okay. Next week, we're going to get older. <laughs> Children eh, ages five to 12 or so. So we're going to go back to looking at emotional well-being, mental health issues. Again, a lot of this, I think, will be very relevant for um, thinking about younger children as well. But specifically, there are and I'll be sending these out. There are some really useful resources and things to think about with respect to helping families de-stress, create calm environments at home, um, not just for children who have special needs, but helping children in this age group with understandable anxiety or children who already struggle with anxiety in this context. I also want to think about and talk about, and again, if you have some um, special experience, please let, please let me know, but child maltreatment. You may have read about something paradoxical that has been happening during the pandemic. At first, people looked at statistics about child abuse, child maltreatment, and said, why? It looks like it's going down. But as many of you may know, what seemed to be the case was not that the incidence of child maltreatment was going down, but that reports were going down because think about who the reporters, the mandated reporters are. They are teachers. If schools are closed, the teachers are not seeing the children. They are health providers and routine healthcare uh, visits, often by many families, were going down. The kinds of social supports that help family home visiting being a wonderful example, 
the kind of social supports from either professionals or just friends, neighbors, people stopping by that can buffer and create resilience in stressful situations have been, if not absent, at least uh, greatly reduced. So it certainly is a matter of huge concern among people who work with issues around all kinds of child maltreatment. So those are some of the things that we're gonna look at next week. I also have a pent up desire um, on a very different note in some ways that may be more positive than some of, these, some of these topics, but there are, and I have to show you some of them, great, there's a great project that UNICEF has been doing. They have had children doing little video diaries during COVID and in different countries. So I've got South Africa, Yemen, and so on. So I think it would be very um, enlightening and create a lot of insight to see how children in not just different countries, but different conditions are thinking about dealing with living through this global crisis. And um, some of it is, is funny and heart, heartwarming. And oh my goodness, talk about resilience. I and mean, some of what you see in these children and these families would make you kind of, don't complain people, you know? So that's it. And have a good weekend. And thank you so much. Special thanks, Laura, for sharing. And uh, Best of luck to everybody. I had my shot Wednesday. First one. Yay. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.